Welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. I did no prep work for this podcast, probably because a Google or a Wikipedia search wouldn't turn up things that I actually already know or things that I know in way better detail. This is a podcast about athletics and sport, the impact of a great coach and mentor, the fraternity of teammates. It's about capturing the nuances of life in art the power of following one's passion, and it's also about a partnership. My guest today is a father of two beautiful girls. He's a professional sports artist, and he's also my husband, Tony Harris. Hey. Hi. (laughs) This is so weird. I saw you an hour ago. (laughs) You did. We did come and we came in separate cars, though. We did. We do a lot of that. Yes. Because we go in different directions after. Because our life's crazy. Because we're we're taxis for our children when we're not trying to be professionals. Wow. You're, you're a professional these days. I'm, I'm trying to fake it. You're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, and I don't like the fake it till you make it thing. I don't like that quote. It's never been mine. No. No. So I, we were joking because when we, we were, I think I was brushing my teeth this morning as we're kind of getting ready to come here. And I'm like, okay, so this is where I'm thinking. There were so many different directions for us to go in. And you're like, what are we going to be talking about? But I think your background in sport, in growing up at Lakefield, in the impact that you've had with so many amazing coaches and mentors has really shaped who you are. And I think has trickled down into the work that you do. And I should mention for those that are joining, because a lot of people in the in this city know of you or know the relationship, but the professional sports artist in you. I mean, you are painting some of the biggest athletes in the world right now. You were hired by Gary Bettman to paint the top 100 NHL athletes of all time for their 100th anniversary. We called them hockey players. What did I say? NHL athletes. I love the way you do it. You're, you've got a. <laughs> for those that don't know, my wife is a uh, comes from a a U.S. college sports background, so she refers when she she calls everybody coach, and everybody's an athlete or a student athlete or. Yeah, they're hockey players. They're... Anyway, I'll... sorry. <laughs> it's going to be this kind Ro- of podcast. Ro- Veronica is going, <laughs> Leanne is just going to get spanked this entire uh, podcast. No, but okay. I do yeah. love that. You've yeah. got, you're this little Canadian girl that's got all these little American, I think you even say program instead of program. I don't know. But anyway, go ahead. I might. It, yeah, totally. What I think was really funny, and I'll do this story, is when we went back to Bishop's Homecoming. And that was like the difference of the Canadian and the American sports background. Yeah, when I, that's yeah. So Tony, we were, Tony was a quarterback. Tony, well, he was also a goalie. Yeah. We're going to get to this, but this is a funny story about the we difference. Just that we went back. Yeah, I was very excited about bringing you back to Bishops for homecoming, and I was like, you know, it's going to be fun. There's going to be like three thousand people in the stands, and the, you can see like you look out over the farmers' field, and you can see the cows, and but it's going to be a lot of fun and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm sort of looking over and I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, you went to UMass. Okay. National championship basketball. How many people did you compete against like in yeah. gymnastics? And I don't like we had arenas with 10,000 10, people. people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slightly yeah. different experience. Okay. Yeah. We were just discussing that we've been together in 19, 19 years, March 19th is yeah. our, so yeah. almost what day is it? Oh, we're, well, we're right the there. End of yeah. Our vacation. Yeah, which is when exactly when this aired. So 19 years. We met in 2000. Well, I'm not going to go through fully the entire story of how we met. It's really quite... You Your know, story. I, well, I could tell it in a minute. You tell it in 15 minutes. I but might, I'm not going to tell it. My way of story is way better. It, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so I am... We're going we're gonna to do this. I'm sitting at Good Life Fitness, which was then Queensview. <laughs> By the way, Tony just took I could took go off. get a cup of coffee right now. <laughs> Let you tell this story. I'm sitting, I and I'm and I'm sitting at the gym in my UMass T-shirt, and Tony, who I've never seen at the gym before, is sits down next to me, and he's wearing a BU T-shirt. And so you sit down next to me, and, and I kind of say to you, "Oh, did you go to BU?" And you said, "I said I did, but I, looking at your T-shirt, I don't think it's the BU you're thinking of. It's not Boston U. It's Bishop's University." Right. We talked for like five minutes and Tony was actually visiting a friend 
from Montreal. So Tony didn't live in the city. He had no idea who I was. Like it was, it was a very natural, organic, just meeting on the mat. Yeah. And we met for like five minutes and that was pretty much. A great conversation. Yeah, it was a good couple yeah. of minutes conversation. And then we went on with our lives. And then three months later, this guy who um, you kind of, you know, when you're at the gym or you're in any place and you always see the same people, but you've never met them or you just see them in you passing, them. you will nod. Or if you see them out, you're kind of like, how do I know that person? And then you remember, oh, okay, I see that person at the gym. Anyway, so this guy comes up to me about three months later and, and he's kind of trying to get his words out. And, and he says, listen, about three months ago, you met a friend of mine. He was visiting from Montreal. You were wearing a UMass t-shirt. He was wearing a BU t-shirt. And he said, if I ever ran into you again at the gym to stop you and to say that he would drive in from Montreal to take you out for dinner. And I remembered the five minutes. It was a good five minutes. It was a good five minutes. But three months later, so that, you know, so Eric, who ended up being our best man, was yeah. pretty much the, the one that He was more nervous. He was the one that had to go through the nervousness of essentially <laughs> asking you out. Because all I had to do was, hey, I'd give her a call. And I was like, hey. Then I knew that you were kind of interested. So Yes. So And then he goes, um, he kind of gives you a description of, of who you are. And he's like, he's a painter. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know, how am I going to explain this one to my Jewish mom? Uh, and then he comes back. Well, you back. thought it was a house painter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he comes back like five minutes later. He goes, I don't think I did my friend any justice. He's actually like an artist painter. And then I, I think at that point, we were just starting to kind of get into the world wide web of things and, yeah. and websites. So he, I'm working the six and the 11 o'clock <clears throat> news uh, sports anchor at this point. And... I'm working in, in Kimway, the old, like we were still like the new RO, it was like as big CHRO. As this, it is as big as what we're in right now. Like this, the, the TV station was tiny and we, you met me in between my shows. So in between the six and the 11 o'clock newscast, I went out for, for dinner. Well, and then you said, I, I figured Saturday because that's when everybody goes on dates, like, or I could come in and, and, and I, and you're like, okay, well, I, I do, I do a bit of work on Saturday. So could you meet me between shows? And I had no clue what you were talking about. I was like, but I was still like, yeah, I'll come in, I guess. I don't, okay, I don't know what these shows are. And then I realized that you were on TV and then we yes. went on in between. So. so we went out in between the two, in between the six and the 11. And what I loved is that when you came back and we had a good dinner. Well, so you, I, I said, got a call back. You, so had, you, I had said, a, you had an out. You could have easily, yeah, you had a great out. You could have said, yeah, I had to go. Okay, get I got to go to work. So I'll see you later and then never right. see me again. But I, but it was good. So I said, why don't you come and listen in on the show? Like come in and listen on the control. So he came back right before the 11 o'clock news and you came back and put a coffee on my desk and it was a coffee with exactly what I liked in it. You had watched what I put in it at dinner Yeah. and you came back and he had my two creams and my two Details sweetener. for all those young <laughs> people dating out there. Listen to the details. It's good. It was good. And yeah. then the next day I got a package full of candy. Because you had a lot of candy on your desk. I had a lot of sour candies. And so that was that was a pretty cool thing. Yeah. We went out for our real actual like that I didn't have to work date a week later. We went to the Empire Grill for those that are in the city and remember back in the days of the Empire Grill. And we both knew on that date that we were pretty much getting married. We talk about it. Why are you looking at me like that? Yeah, we did. Yeah. When I said, when did you know? And he's like, this is when I knew. It was we both knew on the same time at the exact same time on the second date. Why are you looking at me like I've got <laughs> like looking, crazy eyes? Because I, I thought earlier than that. What a save that was. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> second date. Um, yeah. Let's go on with the interview. Okay. So there you have it. It's a good story. Yeah. And when Tony tells the story, he says it way differently. And then he adds a lot of details that are unnecessary. <laughs> I did that in one minute. Oh, no, 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 His no. His would say no. yes. And then he adds in X-rated things that did not happen. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we had a good three months of courting, but I like to throw in that we consummated our relationship like the first but we night did not. which we and never it drives did drives me nuts that he yeah. always says she always that. tells this beautiful story and then i go and then we had sex and then she's like no <laughs> we, we, we it was like three months <laughs> yeah oh where is this podcast gonna go okay so then i find out as we are in the courting process there's a really interesting background you grew up at lakefield college school mm -hmm. you grew up in a very small town but i grew up at a really cool place like i had a very unique i like to think i had a really unique uh, childhood, which, you know, if I look back on where I am today, there are so many little things that fell into place um, when I was growing up that sort of led me to where I am. 
which which I think I diverted from for several years before I got back on path. So it's it's a private school, mm-hmm. and your dad Andy was a, a teacher there. Yeah. So if you think about it this way, um, you know, people in you know, so it, it's a private school, and back in the seventies um, and and eighties in Canada, especially when you were in a private school, you could, your, your kids, and this is all, you know, this was Canada wide. If you're a, of the son of a professor, a teacher at, at, at the school, you actually, you went, you could go to school for free. Like you didn't have to pay. And there was no taxable benefit. There was no small, like there was no fee. And I think it was about two years after I graduated in 1982 that the government stepped in and went, what is this schmazzle? Like all these. So, so now if you're a teacher at these schools, I mean, you're paying, you're not paying full price. It's a a benefit of sorts, but you are having to pay a significant amount of money to go there. So we had three boys that went to school for free. And I think, you know, let's say the education back then was probably twenty thousand dollars a year, equivalent to what is it to go there now? I think now it's fifty. You know, between probably fifty, and when all said and done with your extracurricular stuff, maybe you know somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year for the education. So we went free, and we lived on campus. So we had the bonus of, you know, essentially being boarders, but living at home and could watch TV and go to bed when we wanted to. So it was a really unique upbringing. And you are. You are studying next to some of Canada's biggest names. Am well, I allowed no, to no, say that? Like, it's like the business. Studying. No, but but yes, there there and and those are connections that I still have today, right? Like, there's the you know Irving, the Irving family is there. The Eatons at the time were there. We had you know at one point there was Molson and Labatt's was there. Prince Andrew went there. Then uh, Prince Philip, who's now the King of Spain, was there at certain time. Like it, it was a it was a great school, and it had a. Uh, it had a, a real global appeal. And so for a kid, I mean, it's, if you think about it, I'm growing up in a town of 2,000 people, but just happen to be living on a in this little bubble that is very metropolitan, has access to, you know, you know, uh, the arts and, and, you know, advantages for children that you would never have if I was just a kid that, you know, if my dad was a butcher and lived in the town and you know, did that. Not not to say that that doesn't can't lead you to where you want to go, but it was a really it was a really unique uh, upbringing. And your dad was a one of the favorites. He had a, he had a great appeal. Yeah, my dad was a so my dad taught English and was heavily into theater, but was also a great athlete. And I think that's you know where the where my whole background sort of hinges on is that you had um, a group of teachers at the school. That and 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 the whole idea of the school was sound mind, sound body. So you you had to do everything. Like you had to do a sport every term. You you couldn't just sit on your butt. Um, but you were really encouraged to do things in the arts, whether it was visual arts or, you know, writing or uh, you know, acting, whatever it was. Um, you kind of had to do that. Like you, that was part of the part of the whole makeup of the school. So, I mean, you you. You know, there was no embarrassment. There was no like, oh my God, I got to get up and sing. It was like, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's bring it on. So we were, you know, I think between my dad, who was a, you know, he played junior B hockey as a kid, and you know, and I always think of guys that played junior B or junior A hockey in the '40s. I mean, there was, you know, there were only six NHL teams. Like there was, if you were if you were playing at that junior level, you were probably pretty good because there was, you know, there was nowhere else to go. Like there was there wasn't as many. You know, you can spit and hit a you know, national champion now, but back then it was, it was a little different. So, and then Bob Armstrong, who played in the NHL for many years, he was our, our hockey coach, head of athletics and Richard Heyman, who was my art teacher was probably the biggest influence on my artistic career, well, obviously on my artistic career, but he was a, you know, he was a, a like a world-class rugby player and soccer player. And he was, he was British and grew up in England and, and, you know, was terrific. And, and I think for me, the greatest thing was that, when it got into, you know, to, I guess to skip ahead to my artistic career, I was able to do things that were important to me. So I wasn't, I wasn't going through a Jackson Pollock stage of splattering paint and you had to do this. It was, you know, I wanted to paint Lynn Swan wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but we could try to do it in a different style, you know, but, but Heyman was very much like, absolutely, like, you know, pick your subject matter and then we'll figure out a way to do it. So that to me was like huge. 
Because you're growing up on this campus playing every sport imaginable. I mean, and you did. I mean, you excelled at football, you excelled at hockey, and then at the same time you could run back over to the art studio and express and have that artistic side. Yeah, and think of a school where, um, you know, the, one of the really unique things about Lakeville was the art room was in the main building at Lakeville College, and the there was a door to walk in from the main hall, and then there was another door that went right into Mr. Heyman's house, the art teacher. So his his house was attached to the art room. And the older you got, it was sort of like this rite of passage. The older you got, like once you got into grade 11 and you could, you were staying up a little bit later, I mean, you would have these nights where, and he was an artist, like he was a working artist selling his, selling his work. He was a potter. Like he, I, I try to explain to people how good of an artist Richard Heyman was. And it's, I, I can't do him justice because he could do everything. Like I can draw and paint. But he could draw and paint and sculpt and pot. And then he would build sets for the play that were, you just go like, this is a high school production. Like he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. But he lived, his, so his house is attached to the art room. And, you know, you would have 10 guys in there working on their artwork till midnight on a school night. And it was cool. It was like, well, we, you know, and he would say, well, we got to get this stuff done. And if you want to do it, stay and I'll stay up with you. And and the the really interesting thing that would never happen now, he kept a he kept like an industrial sized pot of coffee right inside his door, like you'd open the door to his house, which was his kitchen, and he had this, and he would drink coffee and smoke cigarettes in the art room, like in school. It was a different time, but so there'd be, you know, he'd, there's always anything I did in, between grade eleven and grade twelve, it has a nice sort of whiff of nicotine to it because he'd be over your shoulder smoking cigarettes while he's teaching art it was crazy yeah. at midnight on a school night yeah. from next door I, I i i've always said that your your childhood your upbringing is is really unique and you had uh kelly and craig so two brothers that yeah. are going through this experience with you and both athletes at the same time and there's so much to get to so i you know i love you but i'm gonna have to skip through some of the some of the well, stories I love you too thank you you get through Lakefields, right? You're, you have this background. Your dad's a teacher. You, you, you don't really know what's going on, but you're still playing hockey. You've got an opportunity to play for the Kingston Canadians, play OHL. You're a goalie. I'll run through, so let's this, let's go. Yeah, you so I end up. At, I think you're going. I end up at Bishop's University. You don't so end the, up so Bishop's. The quick, yeah, you, so the you quick, went the quick route for me to get there. I went to. Uh, I I, did, I was. You know, I was a terrible student. I was a, I loved art, didn't particularly like going to school. Um, and in the summer, and I worked my summers at Roger Nielsen's hockey school, which, which I think is a huge part of how I ended up with working with the NHL. But, but to start with that, so I, I work at Roger's hockey school and I meet a ton of friends and one of them, Bob Airy, who played for the Penguins, he was playing for the Peets, Peter Rowe Peets at the time. And he was like, you should come and try out for the Peets. And I'm like, well, I can't just come. So he phones Dick Todd and he says, I got this, this goalie here and he would be totally good. You know, he should try out. So as it was, they had a shortage of goalies that year. So I went and tried out for the Peets and I played the full exhibition season, which is really cool because they have newspaper clippings with uh, shut out, you know, Tony Harris shuts out the uh, Oshawa Generals and Steve Eiserman scores three goals. So that was, you know, pretty cool. So I ended up playing the whole exhibition season with them and then... Uh, one of the Evans brothers, which is a famous Peterborough family, he comes back as an overage goalie and Dick says, hey, I, Tony, I'm going to have to let you go. So at this point, I go to McMaster University, which I had enrolled to to play hockey. And I go to Mac and I'm and I'm so disillusioned with going to school. And I, I had a taste of I think I wanted to play hockey. So I made the hockey team, played hockey, but really didn't go to school. So and this is a tough thing to tell your 14 year old daughter when she's talking about universities and stuff. And it's like, dad, how did you, what, what you went to three different universities and you have to explain that you got kicked out of one. Why'd you get kicked out? And so you be honest, I didn't go to classes and that's what happened. And I got kicked out. So in that case, and I'm trying to run through this quickly, my dad, who was such a nice man, like we have, when we talk about our parents, it's just, he was, you know, gentle and kind and, you know, as stern as he ever got, he just said, look, you're on your own. Like, I'm not going to pay for your university. You screwed up. So, you know, figure out what you're going to do. And and that was my first real, I was now 19 and I had to figure out what to do. So I wrote a bunch of letters to 
OHL teams because I still had two years of eligibility left. And uh, the Kingston Canadians picked me up. So I went to play for Kingston and they helped me get into Queens part time. So I took three courses at Queens. Um, and then I got cut from the Kingston Canadians in around we were November. dating it now because you they yeah were they're now the kingston front <laughs> that's right <laughs> but they were called the canadians anyway yeah. the short the short story of this incredibly long story now which is <laughs> no, impossible but they um so i end up uh being cut i finish out at queen's i get marks good enough and so i remembered i was going to go to bishops initially out of grade 13 and play hockey and football and they dropped their hockey program so i said well i'm not going to do that and then I was like, I think I'm going to be a football player. So I phoned Bruce Coulter and I said, hey, Bruce, you know, we had talked about me coming two years ago. Is, could I still, you know, do you need a quarterback? Could I still come? I'd like to try it for the team. And he's like, absolutely. So then I went to Bishops and that's where I really found my groove, so to speak. As a quarterback. Well, as, a, as an athlete, but also, you know, I, you know, it turned out that I could do art there. And, and although I didn't take art courses formally, I ended up, doing portraits of athletes, which is really how I started. Just you've just, in this story, you've you've brought up two names because you brought up Bruce Coulter and you brought up Roger Nielsen. Yeah. And these are two men who I think had deep impacts on mm -hmm. and and life-changing impacts on, on how you look at things and how you developed as, as a man. So do you want to hit on Roger? Because you kind of go through Roger first uh, as to the relationships that you had at his hockey schools. As a yeah, Ro counselor, like you were there and you met, there's a ton of stuff that went on then. Right. So Ro Raj, I got hired, I was 16 as a counselor. And then also Ian Armstrong, who's, you know, our best friend, Ian got hired as well. Um, so we were counselors at Rogers Hockey School growing up. And, you know, Raj was just, you know, I mean, if you have a palliative care um, uh, facility named after you, you know that you've you've lived a good life. You know that you've done things right in your life. And that's Raj. Like he was just, he was a prince of a man. He was so kind and so good to people. And, and, you know, one of the things that I'd learned from Raj was that he would, he would reach out to people. You know, he was the kind of guy that you would ask things to. And, and I, and I didn't never, I mean, I, I don't actually have a story where I said, Hey, Raj, could you introduce me to so-and-so? But he, trust me, he did that for so many people. And I like to think that Roger is sort of the Kevin Bacon of the National Hockey League. It's six six degrees of Roger. If you talk to anyone that has anything to do with the NHL, you could probably in four moves or three moves or even less get back to where, oh, yeah, my dad was coached by Roger or, you know, something like that. So um, Roger, what, what I got out of Roger's hockey school was a unbelievable group of friends that are still in hockey today. So Devin Smith, who works for the NHL Players Association, and uh, Chris King, who works for the National Hockey League. Um, even, you know, guys like, you know, Kay Whitmore or Colin Campbell or these guys, they all work for Raj. So when, you know, when, when it came to a part later down the road where my professional life was starting to interact with hockey, um, in, in hockey circles, I wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a stretch. Like, who is this guy again? It was like, that guy worked for Roger. Yeah, I remember him. Like, so... Um, so those connections have been unbelievable. And Mark Crawford, who's, you know, one of our great friends who, who, you know, I met Mark when I was 16 and he was 20 and, you know, we've been, he used to, he used to throw the football around with, like his training was throwing the football around with me at, at, um, which is probably why girl was, you know, didn't have a better playing career. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there are just so many guys that I met there that were. That Roger was also one of the first portraits that you that you did. It was the first one that you did with the Ottawa Senators. Yeah. Which I think really kickstarted you doing so many of the portraits for the NHL and for players. But it's very special when you walk into Roger Nielsen's house to see yeah. that portrait. I loved watching it being created. Yeah. In the four days that I did it. Yes. Tony had a very quick turnaround time for that painting. Yeah. Guilty. I was painting <laughs> guilty on that one. That's one of the one times you've been really upset with me. And I don't drink a lot, 
You do not drink. But I had, we are like the we are like the lamest. If people want an easy night out, like if they just want to go out for a really nice dinner and some good conversation, Tony and I will get the call. Like we are the go out, have a nice right. dinner, have we're, a glass, we're a the, glass or two of wine, and we're home and we go home. Yeah. We are not. Sadly, we're not the like the rock. We are not couple. the. Oh my god, let's go for a rock in time. Let's call Leanne and Tony. Yeah. That's not us, and we are very aware of it. And when we are able to join in and last, like people are like, oh my god, they they pulled through. And, like, and then we, we were rock stars. Feel really good about ourselves. Yeah. One, one year, our goal, we made a commitment that we were going to party. Like, we were going to <laughs> we were gonna drink we more. Were gonna drink yeah, we more. were the only people like a, that said, couple, we're going to drink more this year. A couple of years ago, we kind of sat down and we're like, we can do this. Yeah. We can drink more. We I don't have... know how many people <laughs> no, actually don't. say that, but we actually made a commitment. It was really sad. <laughs> it was. But I actually, my tolerance went up. Now I can actually yeah. have like I'll now, grab a bottle. You right. drink more. <laughs> now I drink yeah. more. I don't know if it's the circumstances surrounding your life <laughs> so much as but yeah. Uh, yeah. But you did so that was one of the very few nights where you actually had I been did. out and I and you were and you were hung over. Well we woke you up and you had you that had to be it, up yeah. early mm-hmm. and I came in with a friend, Don Nichols, who was from out of town and we were Yes. That's when I was I'm basically my art world was the golf world because yes. I was painting uh, pictures kind of-, of golf courses, which is another story, but but I had this commission for Roger and it had to be done for a certain time and and so yeah, the next morning I was like basically I painted out of spite because you had sort of flipped on me. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna get up and I got up at eight o'clock and my head was pounding. <laughs> A splitting headache. So I drew, yeah, I drew Roger with a tension headache that was unbelievable, yeah. but I got through it. It's a great painting. And it's one of my favorites too. It really is. Uh, okay. You have this experience, you have the hockey school, you have these relationships. You end up though at Bishop's playing football. Yeah. Which is the kickstart, I think, to some very special, unique relationships. Well, Bruce Coulter, who is my coach, and, you know, we went to his funeral this last summer and you know, how many kids came back that, that he coached and lives that he touched. And he was, you know, like, I think, uh, you know, my, my dad and my mom are certainly, you know, so important in my life. And then, you know, I, I then, then there's Bruce, there's Bob Armstrong and there's Bruce Coulter and they're, you know, they just, they were like, you know, I think between my dad and Bob Armstrong and Bruce, they were they were the kindest men and they were all teachers of kids like they they all taught and they all made huge impacts on people's lives like we will talk about Bruce Coulter for a hundred years you know and well what made them so what made them so unique what made it so that hundreds upon hundreds of kids came back for his funeral and to celebrate his life like what was why was it such an integral part I th- you know I I I think when you look at people that have, you know, um, especially in universities or, or coaches, there's a lot of stumbles with a lot of them. You know, like you, you, you think of uh, Bob Knight, like Bob Knight, there, there are players that played for Bob Knight, Indiana basketball coach, who will say he was an incredible coach. He was an incredible guy, but he might've been a racist. He would hit players you know, he, there, there are, there are things in his resume that just aren't on the up and up. Like he's done some things that are, that are not fantastic. Like Bruce Coulter has none of those. And it's not because he, and it's not because they're hidden. It's just, he was, he was a great coach, a great mentor, but he was a really kind man and he did the right things. And he would, he would, you know, and Roger was like that too. Like he would, he would, you know, you know, sometimes something happens and someone goes, hey, that's just not right. And you kind of look and you go, yeah, you're right. That's not right. But but they get it before you do. They had figured, like, they have that sort of, like, immediate, that's just wrong. You know, or you can't do that. Like, and that was Bruce. Like, Bruce was just, always had, he was, he he always did the right thing. And it sounds really hard to believe, but it's true. He also, and I remember you saying, would know amongst a team of how many players are on a football team. He would know how each individual athlete needed to be coached. Yeah. That one needed to be so, cuddled, one needed to be motivated. Right. Yeah, and I think in our, you know, in our my relationship with with Mark Crawford and, you know, Mark's won a Stanley Cup and is now working hard with the young players of the Ottawa Senators. <laughs> uh, but 
But I remember when, you know, he would ask me about Bruce when he started coaching. He's like, like you know, and it's such a hard question. What makes so-and-so a great coach or what? But I, I, I think that one of the gifts that Bruce had was that he could tell. And I think it's so key. He could tell who he could yell at and who he couldn't yell at. And he would treat them in a way that he didn't upset everybody else on the team. It wasn't like, well, why do you yell at him and you don't yell at me? You know, like, uh, and, but he knew, he knew, like, and I was a guy you could yell at and I knew that it wasn't personal, but he knew that it could be like, come on, like, what are you thinking? And that wouldn't, that wouldn't hurt my psyche. I would go, you're right. Okay, let's go forward. And then there were guys there that he knew that he couldn't do that, that it had to be, you had to give them, Hey, you did that great, but you can't, you got to do this. You, you can't. And he just knew. And I think that, you know, as a coach, it's like a, it's a huge gift. And I think for any teacher, actually, it is. I think we're, we're lucky and our daughter's got a teacher right now that we're amazed with. Like, she's just really good at, it is am- at, 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 at picking it because our, our kids can be complicated. And, and she's just so good at, at, at reining them in and bringing them down and, you know, I've even talked to other parents in that class and they're going like, oh my God, like, who is this? this- Jennifer Iveson, we're going to give you a shout out at Chapman Mills. Um, but it is amazing the impact a good teacher has, like how it just changed everyone's It'll outlook. It'll shape your like- life as a kid. Yeah. Like, it, like, and, and that's- And, and, so- and your dad, Andy, had that, had yeah. that impact. You saw that in a and father, I, had I, that impact right. on students. And I still get that from from sixty year old people that I run into that that'll say, "Oh my God, your dad, he, you know, he changed my life. He was so good." And it it's so nice to hear. And so we're going through that right now with the teacher for yeah. Jamie. I know that she will forever remember Mrs. Iveson, right? Yeah. And, and and going through the outlook of being excited to go to school because there was things that she yeah. was going to be able to do and learn. Bruce allowed you to be this quarterback. I mean, because first off, you stopped playing hockey. I have don't I've never even recalled you playing in nets once since we've met. I don't think I've seen you in. Oh, it'll never happen. Like right, as soon as you were done. Listen, goaltending is stupid. <laughs> it's uh, and and I played when it hurt. Like when I played hockey as a goalie, you know, equipment was. A, like I'm really dating myself, but it was made out of felt, right? Like you get hit with a puck, it hurts. It, it now goaltending doesn't hurt, so it might be easier for me to go back right. and play. Not that now, it's an easy position. Could, no, I don't right. know if you'd be able to move all the pads. Yeah, especially with that hip. I have an artificial hip. <laughs> yeah, I can. By the way, he does. He's not that old. <laughs> he's talking about his artificial well, hip. Me too. Quarterback, you guys had a great run. I we mean, and did. you, you, you had, and I want to talk about the power of of coaching and this fraternity of teammates. I think sometimes people underestimate what these relationships can do and how they build people up when, you, when you're when you around good people or that they push you in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And you had that. Yeah, we did. We had a, and, and we had a really unique situation because at, at the time I went to Bishops, we were 1,200 students in total. So let's say 600 boys and then 60 boys were on the football team. So, you know, 10% of the boys at the school played on the football team. Like it was... It was a, and we made it to, um, you know, bowl games. Like we, we, we played in the Churchill bowl against the university of British Columbia and just missed out going to the, you know, to the, um, the Vanier cup. So we had a really good, we had a stretch, I think, and we had a, when I was there for four years, I think we had a, you know, we were like 30 and six or something. So that's pretty good for a bunch of guys. And then if you think there's a bunch of guys that we play with that went on to the CFL. And I think one of the neat things was we had, um, we were kind of that, that early eighties, we were right before the NCAA like from a football standpoint was coming up to Canada and finding people. I mean, there were a lot of Canadians going down to play hockey, but there weren't a lot of Canadians going down to play football. So I think about the team that I, that we were on and like Leroy Blue, who's now coach with the Red Blacks and a CFL hall of famer. Like we would, Leroy would have been at USC or, you know, he would have like the, all these guys, um, you know, there was only there was there weren't a ton of Canadians playing in the in the uh, in NCAA at the time. So I think that the pool that we had of guys was was pretty strong. You had a great run. Yeah, it was fun. You did. It's like a heck Crichton. It was like I, I tell you, it was like the Heisman of Canadian football. Which I didn't win. You didn't win, but you were nominated. I was nominated. I know it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we compare it like next to my Atlantic Ten championship rings and stuff, I think it's nice. 
comparison. Oh my God. We're so competitive sometimes. I love that we're both jocks. <laughs> I'm not, I, I totally get where you went to school and what no, you I just, I love that we both compete. Like I think yes. our stories, I think we have an appreciation for each other's stories and what we went through. I wish I had seen you play. It's the one thing, like right. I wish I had seen you and known you when you were playing. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They're a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. And I was lucky that your friend's father got up some digit, <gasps> some some video that he had taken and spliced together some of your highlights. So I hadn't seen, right. until this year, I had never seen you so do gymnastics. We're together 19 years and you kind of, you, I mean, I told Although one you of stories. our first dates, we went to your mom's gym and you were flipping on the trampoline and I yes. was like, that's pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> so and I, was I did still, see that. And that was 19 years ago. So, so I was still were, actually able to do things. Do stuff, now yeah. I'm like, everything hurts. But it was, a fr one of my teammates finally went to the basement and mm -hmm. took up all the VHS camcorder tapes. Yeah, and, I highly and recommend going to Leanne's Instagram feed and finding that. It's really cool. And it was, I, show, I, show it, I show it to my buddies. I go, look, this is, yeah, this is Lee doing. But I, it was the first time I had seen footage of myself in almost 20 years. Yeah. And to tell the kids and show the kids, you know, and especially with Jamie, who's now a gymnast, that mommy actually gets it when she tells her what she's doing right. or why she's scared. I'm like, trust me, I've, I've been there. So you're, you finish bishops. Uh, Cause I want, I'm, we're getting towards the art and the sports and following one's passion. You end up teaching. You do teacher's college. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you talk and see, this is the thing is that you talk about so many of these great men who are such amazing coaches, mentors, teachers. Yeah. And you know, man, my brothers are both, both my brothers teachers. are teachers. Your dad's my dad a teacher. was a teacher and I became a teacher and I, I became a teacher because I had a degree in art history and really was like, what am I going to do? And at the, And when you're, you know, 22, you're not going, oh, I could totally make it as an artist. And I wasn't, you know, people have to understand that my art at the time was very different than what was going on in art schools. Like I was, I painted realistic portraits. That, that was sort of what I wanted to do. And you did it for your teammates. You did yeah. it for people through Sold school, right? Sold them to their right? parents. Yeah, it was great. And it helped me get through school. They were all sort of watercolor portraits and yeah, they were, they were fun to do. And I still look back at, it's funny. You look back at them, you go, that's not horrible. <laughs> I don't say it's not bad or not good, but it's, it's not horrible, but they look like who they're supposed to look like, which they is really key do. for a portrait. Well, I remember I did Mark Hatfield's uh, podcast and, and he's, he's got, yeah, a, he's still yeah, got it. He's, he's got, he's a got portrait that, there, yeah. he's got it framed and up on the wall. Yeah. So where do you end up teaching? So I ended up teaching. So I I ended up teaching at Lakefield College with my dad. So my last year, my dad taught. I taught for a year. The art te Richard Heyman had taken a year off, and they said, "Do you want to come and and take over the art program for a year?" So I did, and it was. And I really enjoyed it. But the my problem with teaching was that I wasn't a good student. I didn't particularly like school, and then being a teacher, I felt like I'm just in school again. So I coached football and hockey, uh, and and teaching the art was fun, but it just wasn't. I wasn't enjoying it. And then I ended up the next year getting a job at Lower Canada College in Montreal. And and I and they didn't have the only spot they had, and I wanted to get back to Montreal because my friends were there and that's where I thought was where I wanted to stay. So I ended up going back there. They said, look, we have a job. It's English and history. So I ended up having to study more to teach grade eight <laughs> history than I'd ever. I was like, oh my God. And these kids knew more than I was. They, they were smarter than me, half of them. So so that was, I did two years there and then I finally, and at the time I was, I was painting and I was selling a little bit and I said, okay, I got to get out of here and I'm going to try to paint. Okay. That's a big leap. Yeah. We, we know about leaps of faith in our house. It's a leap and it wasn't a very good leap. Like it was, I probably should have hung on and taught for another, you know, three or four years and really worked hard at the art in my spare time. Um, because it was a really tough, like the, the first three, four years of doing that were not, not easy years. So yeah, I, you know, living with three guys in Montreal and, you know, you're 
bedroom is your studio and you're you're trying to you know and you're going to galleries and you're trying to get them to buy your stuff and you have no clue what's going to sell and what's not going to sell and then finally the thing that you know that broke for me was the golf business um was just and i you know uh mike fitzgerald who was um who i'd met through a gallery and he was a golfer and i was a golfer and he's he was like you know why don't we do a painting of do why don't you do a painting of a golf course and I'll I'll go and sell it and we'll try to do prints and do that. So that was really what saved me. Like that my entire art career is is because of golf. Right. And that launched it because you ended up then getting into what you'd like to say was the golf business. I was in the, you, I wasn't you, you an never, artist. You yeah. weren't an artist, you were in the golf business yeah. and you were painting all of the signature holes for most of the private golf courses across Canada. Is that fair to say? Canada into the, you know, into Michigan. Yeah, it was good. I had a I had a it was a great business. It was a there was no one doing it in Canada really at the time. There was a couple of people, but uh I think my, you know, growing up and playing golf with my dad and, you know, playing golf my whole life, I had a real feel for golf, which which again I think is you know, skipping ahead is why my, um, my passion for painting sports is, is what it is, is because I feel like I have a connection to, you know, what I'm painting, which I, I, you know, for any young artist out there, I think is the absolute most important thing is to have that connection with what it is that you're doing. Cause if you don't, it's, it's lost. Well, I think a lot of people say that that's why there's, you've found so much success with the paintings is because you've lived it. Or you feel it. You you yeah, see, I haven't you lived see an image, that, but <clears throat> you see an image, or you pick the right the right image that shows what the player, their personality, or right. their, or yeah, their like, focus, you know, there's a or their fine, drive. There's a there's a real fine line because I I have to, you know, if we're gonna you know jumping ahead to hockey specifically, like if I'm doing it, if I'm painting a golf course, I am out there. It, I'm completely on my own. I'm taking the photographs. You know, I might be drawing on site a little bit, um, but I am finding the angle of this hole. If it's, uh, you know, if it's the 18th hole at, you know, Royal Ottawa Golf Club, I'm I'm trying to find what is the best spot that a golfer would be in that they would, that when this image pops up, they go, oh my God, that's the 18th at, at Royal Ottawa. You know, is there a spot that they've been in? Where does it look best? What time of day? Like, how does the, you know, how do you best show off this you know, beautiful clubhouse, you know, where should the sun be? So you spend a day or two days and you go through the, we went through years of you being on the road, getting up at crazy hours yeah, to go get to the get, sun you know, up or chasing, stay there. Basically so chase, chase the sun. Yeah. Chase the sun for years doing that. But, but that's a hundred percent me, you know, figuring out what, what that's going to be. When, when you're doing a hockey player, you are, you know, it's very rare that you're going to be either taking photographs at a game or having someone sit for you. So you are, you're at the mercy of the photographs that are available to you of that, of that image, which if we, you know, talk about the hundred was, was the biggest issue of, of, of painting a hundred hockey players from, you know, from a hundred years. But so, yeah, I, I like to, so I, I have a real, um, I guess, passion for uniforms, how they look, uh, detail trying to get like it it always would bother me if i was watching a football movie that was supposed to take place in the 60s and the football helmet is clearly from the 80s like that would drive me crazy you know it would just go you god like those are details that are important to me so if i'm doing a painting of you know if it's if i just did patrice bergeron's thousandth game and i've got three different images of him from his rookie year to the year they won the cup to this year the specifics of the equipment and and how he wore them and how his you know if he had a wooden stick and how he taped it like those are the most important details for me and they may not be the most important details for him when he sees the painting or or whoever else looks at it but from my standpoint it's it's like the most important thing so i'm i really try to you know i i think um pay attention to those details and then try to find the photograph to me it's like if i was that athlete to use a word from you if i was that athlete would i think this is cool would i think that this is a cool like i don't like big smiley portraits because that that to me is like a snapshot which is great for a photograph but for a painting it doesn't it just shows hey smiling happy i i think it's finding those moments that show someone and i will doctor them a little bit like i 
I think, you know, you would say that I, you know, I can even make. You made Ovechkin. I made Ovechkin really handsome, <laughs> you know, which, <laughs> which I'm sure he is in his own way, but we both know that he's not. So it's like, you know, finding those little bits of like, but, but there are things that you can do artistically that you can sort of tweak um, with a painting and do that, which is, you know, which I, I think is really fun. I, I really enjoy coming down and and seeing the creation of these paintings. What's amazing is that they look so realistic. A lot of times I'll show the paintings and people will say, oh, that's a photograph. And I'm like, no, it's a painting. The the attention to detail and for you to look so realistic, you knew that was the style you wanted. It's the only thing that interest, interested me as a kid. You know, and I go back to Richard Heyman's art room and he had, you know, hundreds of books of art books. And the ones that I would gravitate to were... Um, you know, ones that had realistic depictions or were, you know, much more representational as opposed to, you know, Monet or Van Gogh or which I appreciated. And I think it's a really good thing if you're an art student to learn those things and to learn how to, you know, to try to paint that way. But, you know, uh, artists like Andrew Wyeth were, were the, the ones that I would gravitate to and, and just be, be fascinated with the level of realism that he would achieve. Um, you know, or even, you know, Ken Danby, who I've said before is, you know, I think he's one of our Canadian treasures and a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of art people, what I've discovered. And, you know, even if I think about Norman Rockwell, you know, it's like to refer to Norman Rockwell as an illustrator, just, uh, it really gets me upset because if you think about the level of skill, which he worked and then, you know, creating a painting once a week for the Saturday evening post like I went through that. So I've now lived that, you know, over a year of, of trying to do, what was I doing? I was doing two and a half paintings a, a week, essentially. So, so to, to, to have that level of skill and do that, I think is phenomenal. And he is, he is, I think, one of America's most unbelievable artists that doesn't get his due. You just mentioned the, the two and a half paintings per week. So the life ruiner, we call, we had a rough year that year, it's the, right? The year that I decided yeah. to to leave uh, the morning show, and that was the year we were ju- we were just finishing up that year of the hundred paintings. So you have this honor, which I think is amazing. Gary Bettman and the hundredth anniversary of the NHL. You typically, I would say, with people when people ask me how many paintings does Tony do a year, I would have said usually between twelve to fifteen. Yeah, or twenty. If, but Summer, if but big ones. But some, major, it depends major, if they were the big like a ones. major commission. Right, the major yeah, commissions. And that's what 15. I said. That's probably how many you do a year. And then you you get this commission to paint 100 mm-hmm. in one year. Yeah. We didn't think it through very well. We weren't very smart about that. No. No. We calculate because you, you math, because you're so scientific in how you paint. Well, I think like you know exactly how much time things take. You mathematically figured out how long it was going to take. Yes, and we both know and that we, I'm not good in math. <laughs> and we had essentially about 14 days to play with over the entire year. Over the entire year. 14 days worth of hours. Well, we had a point where where we had lost it. And I, I, I remember coming to you going, we're not going to make it. I, I'm not going to make this. Like it's going to come November and I'm not going to have them done. And we were already like 60, 70 right. paintings. And then, yeah. and then our, our kids went, our kids go to camp for a month. So we agreed that that month was what we, you know, what every parent would, I think most parents would go a month without your kids in the summer is like, oh. is like, is what you dream of, right? Like you, you, all the things that you could do. We love our kids, by the way. We do love our yeah. kids. And so this was, it turned into that 30 days. I said, I'm going to have to basically try to catch up in that 30 days. So I was, I would get up at five and I would paint till 11 at night. And I did that, I think for, for like 25 days in a row. And that was, and that got me back on, that got, that me got back you on back schedule. on track to be able to get to the two and a half or three paintings yeah. a week. To, like when you think of a hundred, like yeah, the crazy and thing about the hundred. We never saw the hundred because you'd have like maybe eight to ten on the ground on the floor, drawing, drawing, you know, and done, and then you would ship them off so that they could get framed. Mm. So we never actually, you never actually saw the depth <laughs> we, of, and because you would finish a painting, and usually in normal life you would finish a painting, come upstairs because the, the studio's in the house, and you kind of 
We'd celebrate it. Yeah, you know, painting's Painting's done. done. Let's have a good dinner, you know, and then you could come down. It was almost like a final exam, right? You study, you study, the exam's done. Yeah. And you're and you're yeah, off. This was this was this was paint and then start drawing right away. And then as soon as the paint the, the painting came off the canvas, it was like the fresh one came off. Like you yeah. said it was like a year of Well, I remember I remember having I remember specifically, I remember having sixty eight finished. It's like I've got I've and I checked them all off. So I've got sixty eight done. I'm like, wow, sixty eight paintings done. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I've got how many more left? <laughs> Thirty two <laughs> more to do. Like it was just it was horrible. Like, even if you think about 32, like, that's crazy. But. It's the, the toughest ones, and I felt for you, are the ones that were 100 years old. Well, the, that, or, to get back to the photographs. photographs yeah. So, right? so if I'm doing a painting of Sidney Crosby, mm-hmm. um, I can go to, you know, three different things. I can go to Getty Images, and there will be, there will be 38,000 pictures of Sidney Crosby. And which sounds like, oh, my God, how do you go through that? That's easy. You you can, you know, I have an idea of what I'm looking for and you can just sort of scroll through and things will catch your eye and you can do that. Um, and, the, and the photographs are digital and they're clear. And, you know, if you want to change a black sweater to a white sweater, it's, you know, I can do that. Um, you know, it's it's super easy. And then you get um, then you get George Vesna, who played in 1919 and 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 you're trying to find pictures of George Vesna and you you know you're working with the Hockey Hall of Fame you're working with the NHL and it's like here's the picture of George Vesna in a Canadian's uniform like this is the one picture and he's standing up straight out and it looks like it's taken outside somebody's garage and he's holding his deck and it's blurry so there's really no detail and and it's like okay here we go and and you really have to do your best. Like those ones would just they kill killed me. You. They killed me. Yeah, because you want them all to have a certain level of, you know. And luckily, when they all turned out, and we, you know, when we do get to see them all together, like it, it is really cool. So, and and I and I'm proudest most of the, of the George Vesnas and the Turk Brodas and the, you know. Well, it was pretty cool to see all hundred once it was completed. You completed the hundred four days after I left. Yeah. CTV Morning Life. Yeah. It was a very big week in our household. Yeah. It was a lot of culminations coming together. But to see all hundred of them all in one room, all like it was spectacular. Yeah, like it was, it, it to, was cool. to sit back and go, you did this. When we were in Montreal and we were sort of looking at it, we were all kind of like, it was it was like, wow, this is really wild. And then because the first time we saw them all hundred, they were at the Bell Center and they had them in the um Concourse. They had them in the concourse and they just went, it was like 50 down one way and 50 down the other way. And like you would look forever and you'd just see these easels with paintings on them. It was wild. It's now uh, the NHL offices. Mm-hmm. They went to the, um, there was a showing in Washington. Like we had they, reproductions they, in Washington. Yeah, that was pretty neat. That was pretty cool at the Canadian Embassy. Um, and now they, if you walk into the NHL office in Toronto, and this is, you know, the one th- people would always say like, why aren't they at the hockey hall of fame or why aren't they? And, and the truth of it is this was a commission by the NHL for them f- so that they could, for their hundredth anniversary, they wanted something that was just for the NHL. Mm-hmm. And so when you walk into the NHL office, the front off you, the foyer, you walk in and then all 100 are on the wall, like on the walls going around. And it looks really, it really cool. Yeah. Because coming from the wife's perspective, I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have like, you could do coffee table books and posters. Yeah. And but it, it was wasn't so much. That. And I'm but it, was, it wasn't that. But a lot of the perception that I got was I left CTV Morning Live because I, we could retire <laughs> because yeah. you had done these hundred paintings for the well, NHL and it was such a big thing. And I'm they like, didn't, they didn't pay me. They, I'm like, you have <laughs> no idea. A, I have not retired. He didn't make a killing doing this. It was really neat, Listen, you know, we but financi- perception yes, but was, is, is was yeah. very interesting. Look, would I do it again? I would, I would, we'd have to have a different, you know. Yes. Yeah, so if it, two years in advance yeah. for yeah. twice the amount. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. Yeah. We, but, but, you know, but am I glad that I yeah. did it? 100%. It's pretty special. Yeah. Uh, TH Fine Art, uh, for people that are listening right now or wanting to see what we're talking about, uh, your Instagram has some great like visuals of it. And I love now, too, that you're showing what it looked like before and after as you're doing paintings. Because there's constantly, they're being given out at Center Ice and 1,000 game mm-hmm. milestones or retirements. You're pretty much the go-to guy now. 
Well, I can't say that. I mean, you can say that. I, I, I can say that. It. But certainly I've got good relationships with uh, several different teams in the league. And when they want to celebrate, excuse me, something, then, yeah, I get to do it. And those are super fun. What's super fun is raising our two girls, Andy and Jamie. Very different personalities. Uh, and I should, you know, I think for people who are listening and who know me and follow me for all this time, you know that there's the athletic background. And now you know Tony has the athletic background. So when we say that we plan to have our kids early in the year, like give them the best chance at athletics, we plan for, we did purposefully did not have baby sex to avoid a baby for November, December. Right. We did not want them to be Right. The the old the youngest of so the our, group. So our girls right. are born one's January so, and one's February. So we actually got pretty lucky. Well, we didn't have baby sex during those months to, to avoid it, and then we ended up with January, February. Right. Giving our giving our children the best chance at it, you know, at sports. I'm full on admitting it. And I have we you know, we come from two athletic backgrounds. We know how it works. Well and, it, and I think there is some truth to it that the right. that you they're a little bit older, you're a little bit more experienced, you you're a little bit bigger. Well I have if a, they had been boys. Right. And I have a you know, very quickly, I have a brother who was born December tenth, who is a great athlete. And and for whatever like he went to university, he was a great high school athlete and I think should have gone and tried to play university hockey, but didn't you know, he just uh, whatever reason he, he was always the youngest guy on the team. I was born January 8th and it, it just, it was like a natural thing. I just went and played university sports and I, like, I don't know. And we, I, I'm not a, I never think of myself as a better athlete than my brother. It's just circumstances. And it, there, there ended up yeah. being a book, the outlier, uh, yeah, yeah. the outliers, is that what it's called? Yes. We never read the book. We just kind of had done this to ourselves. Anyway, we had two girls. So as soon as they were girls, the, the hockey, I yanked that pretty quickly. Like it was great that they were January, February, but we didn't end up doing that. But we you had, say that if they and, really wanted to play hockey, they could have played. Yes, hockey, absolutely. But, they, but it wasn't. What's been interesting, interesting is our comparison with having children who are in a team sport and in an individual sport, and yeah. this is always the fun battle at our dinner table. Well, yeah, and and yes, and I'm constantly reminded that I, I'm constantly reminded that I don't get it. That's our daughter phoning. <laughs> Do I take that? This yeah. At this point, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Jamie. I'm 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 doing a podcast with mommy. Am I interrupting? Oh, a hundred percent you are, but I took it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she just hung up. Okay. Um, so that's Jamie. She's the she's the gymnast. She's the gymnast. Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty thought she... that's awesome. <laughs> I haven't had that. My kids. No, I know. I should have put her on school. speaker, but we'll, we'll yeah. anyway. They're usually in school anyway, but it's March break. It's March break. Yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? Jamie, Jamie's following a little bit more in my. The, yeah. Yeah. So our point. discussions and, and, and are. And Andy is. is I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly reminded that I don't get it. About. Because the individual she, sport. So, yes. G, well, not, not just the individual sport, but certainly gymnastics. And Jamie is. So she's 11 and she does 20 hours of gymnastics a week and goes to school full time. I have friends. I have friends in the. <laughs> and I won't name them that are. In the financial world, I don't think they work 20 hours a week in their jobs. But yet our kid is like, <laughs> it's like she has two jobs and she's 11. And and I get that, you know, you need to learn to crawl before you can walk in gymnastics for safety reasons. I, I do get that. But, you know, I also find that every every other sport in the world seems to be practicing less. Like if I think about football, when I played football to football now, like the, I, they, there's hardly any contact in practice. Like you just don't do it and your practices are shorter and let's, you know, up tempo and let's try to, you know, learn, you know, keep it going like that. And I'll go, I will go to get my daughter. We'll drop her off for a four hour gymnastics practice <laughs> that is supposed to end at seven 30 and it's seven 35. And she's still, I'm like, what, why did they, what, what are they doing in that extra five minutes that is so important that they couldn't have done in the four hours before while I'm waiting to take her home? Like it's bizarre, but I, you know, I, having watched it and gone, you know, being, I'll tell you what, yeah. being a parent of a gymnast is not fun because you, 
watch them on the beam or on the bars and you're just, your gut is just going, please. It's funny because I'll watch parents like on the sidelines because Andy plays soccer and like, and there's parents that are like really nervous, like going the, you know, and right. I'm like, why are they nervous? Like, I mean, there's a whole team of people out here. Right. I have no reaction whatsoever to Andy playing soccer. Right. But if Jamie's competing, I'm like completely in knots and I'm like, well, this is what other parents must feel like right. when they're watching their kids. Play and we get sport. like watching Andy. I, I'm Love the same it. way. I don't, yeah. but listen, when they, you, you scream when they win and score yeah. and stuff like it, you're into it. It's just not, it's not, it's a different kind of nervousness for sure. Thinking ahead. I mean, we have these two girls. It's funny. They're very different personalities. Mm -hmm. We see each, each other and each of their personalities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You about to say the negative stuff is what we find in. You're looking at me like, where are you going with this? No, I'm not. I'm not looking. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie's issues are yours. Andy's issues are yours. Do okay, what are you saying that Jamie? Yeah. You saying that Jamie's issues are mine? No, they're mine. Like they're I'm yours. thinking that yeah. You and Jamie are very similar. And you and Andy are very similar. And Andy and I are very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to say this early on. Andy is sweet like sugar, and Jamie is sweet like shit. That's what we. <laughs> that's what we used to say. And we mean that in the kindest way, but, but yes, that's, uh, yeah. Not that you're sweet like shit. Cause you can be super sweet. I can, but, but you I, are, but yeah. yeah, you listen, if, if, if Andy is, is, you know, like work has to work harder at school to get by, Jamie is smart. You are smart. You, you know, but you're, and you're both stubborn. But Andy's just you're such a you good person. Stubborn. And you are you're such stubborn. a good person. Andy is such a good person. Yeah. I think we realize the, the positive characteristics yeah. in, in each of our, in each of our, our kids for sure. Well, you, listen, and Jamie is a good person too. And you're a good person. You're just, you have, you're stubborn and you, you will, you're both principled. You're both have, you, if you're right, you're right. And you try to, yeah, you don't suffer. Let's put it this way. You don't suffer fools gladly. And that's Jamie as well. Like Jamie's, at 11 has already figured out who the phonies are and who they aren't. Whereas Andy gives people the benefit of the doubt. We have gone through, we should have a parenting show. We should. Oh my <laughs> I gosh. I had did a lot of those parenting panels. We have been through quite a bit in the last year and a half. It has been you and I personally. Yeah. I, and yeah. I've invaded your space. Like I'm now like you had this studio. I don't in the even, homes. I don't feel it one bit. It is not altered. Well, I anything. feel it. I used to get dressed up and was out all day and, you know, had, had, you know, I, I had a very right. different life and now I, you can come upstairs from the studio to go get your snack and I'll be sitting in the kitchen, maybe showered out of my pajamas. I'm not quite sure. Well, you, you know, right. it's, it's a different circumstance. Well, it's different, but I don't, it doesn't, but like, I have no issue with it. And my studio is, is completely on its own and in the basement. Yeah. It's fairly self-sufficient. Like I can be, I can be down there forever. So it's not, you know, so there are, there are two separate workspaces for sure. But, but I have no issue with you. Like I, it has not changed my. No, it's just. Like it, we know people life. that work together and it's like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Yeah, but or we're only a year into that? this. We're not 19 years into, we're a year into me being in the house and stuff. It's been a very, it's been a big transition. For you, it has. Yes. For, for me, me, it hasn't. Wow. Well except for what the days that I'm like, <laughs> I haven't figured oh, it all out yet. Yeah. Those days. Yeah, those yeah. days. I do more counseling than I used to <laughs> as an artist <laughs> during the workday. <laughs> we're figuring things out. We Can are. you believe that we've been chatting already? It's like we're over time. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. We haven't even talked about anything important. What would you like to talk about that's important? Know. No. What, what would you, what's, what, it's funny because there's so many things that I could hit on and know but you're like, what would you be? What would be your biggest guidance then when you talk about following your passion? Because it was a big financial jump also mm -hmm. to kind of go as a struggling artist for a while. But to be able to do and paint and and because you're you've said too, like retirement isn't enough. Like you want to be able to paint and do this for as long as you can. Right. I, I think if you are, to be honest, if, to if you're going to be an artist and you're going to, you know, or, or whatever it is that your passion is, you've got to, it, the romantic side of it is awesome. You know, it's really cool to be creative and to say, this is what I'm going to do, but you have to be grown up enough to treat it like a real job and to 
go at it with a financial plan of some sort. And I, and I certainly in the first 10 years of my job hadn't figured that out. And then finally it was like, Oh my God, I'm going to have to pay a mortgage and stuff eventually. Like you need to, to get to that point where you, you treat it better. And it, I, I was a little late coming into that, but, but now I've got a very good handle. And, and if I talk to young artists or whatever, those, the first things I say to them is you, you have to attack it. Like, um, you know, like if you were an accountant or you were, you know, a professional in a, in a different, um, avenue. And then I think that if you do that, doesn't, I'm not saying take the passion out of the art, but I'm just saying, <laughs> make it, make it financially viable so that you can do it. And then what happens is, you know, like I, in, in, I, I liked painting golf courses. I could probably have painted golf courses for the rest of my life and, and made a very good living. But it wasn't what I wanted to do from an art. I got to a point where, okay, now I'm, I'm making a good living. What do I really want to paint? And then I was allowed to move to, you know, painting the things that I painted when I, you know, my grade three self that Mrs. Marsh would say, oh my God, you drew Tony Esposito. <laughs> and, and I would go, you know, like that finally, you know, once I had the financial uh, foothold, I was able to do the that, you know, say, I'm going to paint hockey players. And that's what I did. And now I'm, you know, yeah. they were drawings happy. in your, they were drawings in your notebooks at school. Mm -hmm. They ended up being watercolors through university to pay your way through. And then it turned into going, moving from watercolors to the oils. To the oil. Yeah. To where you really. Yeah. Got to paint with some, some quickness and, and real, um, like a real sort of a realistic representation. Yeah. Oh, there was that. No, it's. We have a message now to this podcast for young artists. I think, I think, to be honest with you, there's a great thing in the teaching and the impact that people have. Yeah, yeah, and we could go on. We you, these podcasts are fun, so this you we could go on. We could have a whole podcast about mentors and teachers and things like that. There's some amazing people that do that. I'm we're, that have affected us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But just is real. They're my, they're better people. I would love to be able to ask them the questions because they're just them. They're just good people. Yeah, I know. We're trying, Lee. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to take a sip? All right, like we're like I'm I'm out of time. Okay, we got to pack. Enjoyed that. Well, well, you know we can talk when we go home tonight. If we you can. Want more. We can. Well, yeah. We'll chat. It's the people at home that are going, okay, she totally didn't get to this, 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 and this. But one thing I do want to tell people is the podcast is growing and I need people to like it and to subscribe and to share it and to let people know that it exists. Some great topics in the last uh, couple of weeks. Great response. Uh, Graham was on and uh, you know what? A lot of people resonated too with um, Rob Stamper who had the heart attack and mm -hmm. was uh, kind of coming up with these recipes for the soul to be able to recover from that. But please like, subscribe, share, living your life with Leanne. And, and you can find it. It's a good listen. It is. This I, is my. This I was is my traveling. Jamie at uh, the gym the other day, and I had someone come up to me, and they're like, "I listen to it all the time." She goes, "They'll set it in for the workout or for my drive, or I'll go sit in the sauna." Like, right. I, I love it. Listen, it makes I me love feel your good. podcast, and I do. I mean, especially when there's things that you can learn, and 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 there are people. The great thing is, you have people on the show, and then we implement things in our lives that they have that you guys have talked about, but. The the Alexander Shelley, it, it's still my favorite that you've done. And I've listened to it twice, like I will on the road. And I just find it, you know, like learning about like yeah, I don't think when you did background when you too, did right? that when you did that podcast, I don't think that you thought you'd be learning about, you know, what I goes into a symphony and, and the preparation and things like I that. I loved like it, it. Yeah. I think that was a really cool glimpse into a different a world that we had no clue about. And I think that's the fun thing about this. Well, thanks for the support, sweetie. As You're I welcome. leave every podcast Tuesday on Tuesday mornings to go do Podcast Tuesday, of podcast which, of course, Tuesday they come out on Monday. Thursdays, and this one's down on a Monday so that we can get on a plane and head to Punta Cana tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Lee.